Okay, we're live. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us for our Science Sunday broadcast. And this is this time we've got a paleontologist joining us, Michael Habib. And my co-host is Scott Lewis, who you've seen before when we've done Hangouts for December. And he's um, from Cosmo Quest. And go ahead, introduce yourself. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, again, I, I'm Scott Lewis. I'm uh, with Cosmic Quest Education Public Outreach, and we've decided to team up with Science Sunday to start having more hangouts and to introduce um, some of the the scientists that are doing some amazing science on our on our platform here at Google Plus, and try to get a, a series going on. So, as many of you know, that we do have our uh, many different hangouts on air that go out throughout the week, and so we're going to try to start a more regular lineup happening um, earlier in the days on Sundays to coincide with Science Sunday, so any posts going on, and then we'll also be trying to do some hangouts on air. And our premier here is Michael Habib. How are you doing, Michael? I'm doing very well, Scott. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. So if you uh, could introduce yourself real quick, where you're from, any, and uh so we can get started to get into the wonderful world of dinosaurs. Excellent. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Michael Habib. I am a professor at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. I originally come from Baltimore, Maryland, which is also where I did my doctoral work, so my hometown. Uh, so I was trained at Johns Hopkins as an anatomist, and I teach human gross anatomy here at USC, but in terms of my research, I spend most of my time focusing on fossils, the fossil record, biomechanics particularly of fossil animals, and especially flight, both the origins of flight and the performance of flying animals, everything from insects to giant pterosaurs. That's awesome. I'm from the East as well, so all right. I'm, I'm in Very LA good. though too, so. It's all good. It is. It's a little chilly out today. Not too A happy. bit. Right, but but not, February not is more, great. Not from where we're at. You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I looked up when we invited you over was your work on penguins and their flight mm -hmm. underwater. Um, could you tell the people who haven't read your paper kind of the basic findings about that and why that was interesting? Sure. So penguins, of course, are intrinsically interesting not only for being kind of unusual, adorable animals, but by the fact that they are uh, the only living birds that uh, fly only in the water. In other words, they use their, their wings as, they still use them essentially as wings, but they use them only in aquatic medium. There are yeah. other living birds that fly underwater, what we call aqua flyers, but they, but they all do it both in the water and in the air. So they're what we call amphibious. So like puffins, for example, can fly in the classic sense. They can also swim with their wings. Uh, but penguins only swim underwater with their wings. They don't, they can't fly at all. There are other birds in the fossil record that were like that, and in fact, one of them that's not even really fossil record, historical record, that's now extinct, was uh, Pinguinus, Pinguinus, which is the great auk. That's where the name penguin actually comes from. It was a northern hemisphere bird, and then they saw them in the southern hemisphere, they thought they were the same animal, and they're not. But there's been a few other lineages, but penguins are the only, only one alive today, and so they're our best example of what happens when a bird basically becomes a fully aquatic sort of animal. Okay. And it had been previously suggested that if you took a, a non-swimming bird, a bird that swims with the wings in both in the water and flies with them, and then a penguin, it would be a nice, easy kind of grade, a continu continuous grade. There's something like a puffin is basically halfway between being a penguin and being a normal bird. Okay. And that, and that penguins are just, you know, just a little further along the same scale. And what my paper demonstrated is that at least mechanically, Penguins are more different than that. In fact, puffins aren't that mechanically different, and sheer waters and other things that swim in the water with their wings aren't as different from other flying birds okay. as, you, as we would previous, previously had thought they would be. But penguins are really different from everybody. So there's something special about penguins and penguin mechanics. Uh, they have really, really strong wing bones, for example. And, it, okay. and that had been sort of observed previously, but no one had really quanti uh, quantitatively measured it, which I did. And no one had compared the same measure in other birds that swim with their wings. The assumption was that, well, they swim, swim with their wings, water is dense, therefore, of course, they're strong. But palm mm -hmm. don't have particularly strong wings, as it turns okay. out. You can, you can get away with normal strength wings in the water. You just have to change other things about your behavior to compensate for the, how dense it is. Penguins aren't, but penguins have really strong wings. 
So, so there's what, something what do going puffins on there. have to do differently since they didn't have the strong wings? What puffins are doing is they greatly reduce their stroke frequency. So they don't they, they flap at a much lower rate. And they tuck their wings a lot. So they flex them up. So they're only using a fraction of their wing area. So if you look at a penguin, a penguin can't really bend its wing much. It can bend its elbow a little bit, its wrist a little bit. Its shoulder moves lots, but its, its elbow and its wrist don't much. Uh, other birds can fold those a lot, and puffins can still fold those a lot. So they fold at the wrist and their elbow a lot to tuck in their arms, tuck in their wings, and that it makes a smaller paddle. By making the paddle smaller, it reduces the force that would be on it, which compensates for the fact that the water is really dense compared to the air. The penguin, which only uses this flipper in the water, has a permanently short wing. It doesn't have to flex anything because the flippers are always short. Right. That's really cool, you know, especially thinking about, you, know, you would think that they would have to be strong across the board. But, yeah, it would just really depend on, you know, they can really compensate in that way, which, you know, makes sense, especially if we're breaking down to the physics of it. it. It would be really difficult if I taped or glued huge boards to my arms and tried to go swimming. So it would be kind of the same way that's going on. Right, right. It's – and what's happening with penguins is – they have adaptations that are making them, their way of doing it is more efficient. But it only works if you're only swimming. Right. right. So with, with the, and, and in fact, the principle they're utilizing is something that we also look at in, in, engineering, in engineering systems. Um, it's one of the reasons why we tend to use propellers, for example, other, rather than wings in our, in our uh, swimming craft. And it's, it could be of importance if we start to use an aquafly, if we make like aquafly and robots, for example. Um, they're, they're reducing something called surge acceleration. So the surge is literally like surging forward, right? Like uh, if I like lurch forward, that's surge. And what puffins have a problem with is they surge on every stroke a lot right. because they have the one big power stroke and then they recover very slowly and they power again. They, have to, they can only flap slowly because they've got these relatively big wings and, and smaller muscles and everything in this dense medium. So they're powering and they slow down a lot while they're recovering and they surge again. So they're lurching. It's kind of like L.A. traffic. I'm just, you know, I, lurching think the, along I think a puffin goes five. faster than L.A. traffic, actually. Con considerably faster. Especially if you're on the 210 or the <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not fun. Largest parking lots in the world. Yeah. <laughs> But, but they just sort of surge forward. It's like stop and go traffic, right? And if anyone's ever looked at their, you know, cares a lot about their mileage on their car and they look, you know, very carefully, this one thing they do is they look at different driving conditions, right? And it turns out, like, if you're just always cruising on open highways, you get much better mileage than if you spend a lot of time sitting, driving, or in gridlock. You lose a lot of gas mileage by lurching all the time. The yeah. puffins are losing mileage. Right. by lurching. The penguins gain this, they gain this back by not lurching as much. And the way they don't lurch as much is they have smaller wings that they beat faster. So, okay. so they're just maintaining that momentum. As so they're they maintaining the momentum. Right. Yeah. And they also push on the upstroke. So they push on both strokes. So there isn't a stroke, there's no in-between stroke where they slow down. So they maintain right. the momentum, just like you said. And, that, and they gain a lot of efficiency. In fact, they gain so much that penguins are the, are by oxygen usage per unit distance, are one of the, are one of the if not the most efficient, warm-blooded swimmer, whereas puffins are one of the least efficient. <laughs> so it makes a like, huge difference. I guess lifestyle-wise, puffins don't have to swim as much, and it's right. not penalized evolutionary for being so inefficient at it. Right, that's exactly right. They, they just need to have really high acceleration. So what they do is yeah. they fly to where they're going to the fish, dive yeah. into the water, and just they just need to search a couple times and grab a fish. And like, yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. So their, their lifestyle is very efficient as a whole. They're just not a very efficient swimmer. They're fast, yeah. Yeah. Um, but they're not efficient. Okay. I, I, I think I like puffins better, though. But I think mainly because I've seen puffins in their natural habitat, and I've never seen a penguin in its natural habitat. From the, from the northeast, you know, that, that we get we get to go up to Canada and see some puffins, but that's cool. They're awesome. They're really they awesome are birds. awesome. They're really cool birds. So if anyone you know doesn't know what we're talking about, I'll go ahead and, and quick find a, an image of a puffin because they're really really cool looking birds. Um, here we go. Nice. And while you pull that up, one thing I will mention: if anyone who's you know, watching us either right now or the recorded version later. Um, if you go to my Google Plus profile, there is a link now to this Aquafire paper. It is now uh, freely available to everybody. Okay, cool. 
And that's what a puffin looks like. Yeah, here's this cool looking bird. I love the beak. The yeah, beak is I love cool. The but just, you know, the markings on the face is really they're really neat looking birds. Yeah, they're a lot of fun. They're a lot of fun. And they fly very fast. Their top speed is like seventy miles per hour sometimes. I mean it's highway speeds. Oh wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, wow. for an animal I mean, for an animal that's only this big, I mean it's <laughs> right. they're like a little rocket. It's unbelievable. <laughs> I, I, I described that to one of my colleagues one time because that's not a bird, that's a missile. <laughs> it is. Especially with that beak. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, they're very cool. They also have another weird thing that happens with them uh, with puffins, which is because they do have small compact wings, uh, which is a good compromise for the swimming and the flying. When they molt, uh, they go flightless. Okay. So okay. other, so most other birds, they you know they change over their feathers, and for their wings, they have an adaptation where they only change over a couple of them at a time. So they shed a couple of them, and a couple more grow in, and a couple more shed out, and a couple more grow in, because that way they can fly the whole time. You know, they lose a little bit of flight efficiency, but it's not too bad. But puffins, their wings are their what you call wing loading. That is the ratio of their weight to their wing area is so large to begin with that they can't. If they lose even a few feathers from their wings, they can't fly. So they they have so that's selection has pushed them in a different direction. They shed all of the wing feathers they need to shed all at once, and then grow them all back because they're going to be wow. flightless anyway. So if they did a piecemeal, they would just be flightless for longer. Which right. doesn't gain them anything. So, so they've they've accumulated some mutations that squish all that into developmental time. So they just shed them all at once, go flightless for a while. They can still swim, so they can still eat, and they go flightless for a little while, and then they just grow them back out. Have, have you noticed their take? behavior change at all during that time? It does a little bit. So there was work by Ellie Bridge back. Uh, she published on that, like I said, back in like 2004, and <laughs> what she showed is that their behavior doesn't change a lot. I mean, they can't fly out the feeding locations as far, so they basically have to find a good place that's kind of near fish in order to do the molt. And right. then I, um, I guess it lasts for like a month or two, something like that. Okay. Um, and then they, uh, they, they they can just they can just swim out, you know, paddle out and and, and swim for food from there. So they kind of change behavior in terms of where they they are, um, but they also change their swimming mode a little bit. They get a little bit more like a penguin because their wings are smaller now. So they can, they can open up the wings a little bit more and, and flap a little faster, which is kind of cool. Um, now, it turns out that they don't get more efficient swimming. They thought they might actually be better at swimming while they're molting. Um, they seem to be about equal, but it was pointed out that even though the, the, they are compensating to get all these changes in the wing shape, which might help, their muscles don't get suddenly a lot bigger because two months right. isn't long enough for that. So, yeah. So probably, if you grew, if they put bigger muscles on them, they would swim faster in molt than they would out of molt, because their wings are actually better swimming wings during molt. But they just, they, but you have to attach it to a bigger, to a bigger motor to get the, the benefit. Yeah. Out. Cool. Yeah, it's kind of fun. That is really cool. I like that. So, so some other work. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I cut you I was off gonna. Last time. I was gonna ask you to um, talk a bit about the micro raptor stuff you've been doing as well. Because sure. that was really interesting as well. And in fact, while I do that, let me, um, I'm going to do my screen share now. Sure. Um, because I've got some great images to show. Let's see, just so people know what I'm talking about. I think. Well, and while you're doing that, I'm going to mention real quick to all of our, our audience mm -hmm. right now is that if anyone has a question for, for Michael, for any of us to, to mention any comments and things like that, please feel free to leave us messages on the event page on any of the reshares out on Google+. Plus. So if you could also please share that out on Google+, Plus so we can get a uh, better viewership and get a better conversation happening. On Twitter, we're using the hashtag HOA. And so if, um, if anyone has any questions, you can tweet me. I'm, I'm Bald Astronomer. And Michael here is Aero Evo. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Aero Evo. And so please Absolutely. feel free to ask us some questions and, and make some comments there. And we will try to get them uh, pointed in his direction as efficiently as possible. Sounds perfect. Thanks so much. And uh, so in terms of, uh, of images here, I, I, I'm assuming it looks like the screen share is working properly, given my thumbnail at the bottom. So it looks like you guys can all see this yep. black dinosaur feathers on it now. So this is a reconstruction done by David Krentz, uh, K-R-E-N-T-Z. Uh, you may have seen his name before. He works as a concept artist for the entertainment industry. He's worked for, for Disney for a couple of their feature films and things like that. So he's a, you know, he's a big name artist. Uh, he happens to have a soft spot for dinosaurs. And he's a friend, he works mostly here and lives here in LA and he's a friend of mine and of Justin Hall, who's 
one of my collaborators on this project. And Justin and I uh, talked to him about it, and he was kind enough to do this great 3D digital model of Microraptor. And what's weird about Microraptor is, uh, first of all, I should mention, we actually have pretty good evidence that it was black, although that's not particularly weird, but it's kind of fun. What's weird about it is that it has nice uh, main wings, just typical wings on the arms, which this is not a bird, but it's closely related to birds, and we know that a number of different dinosaurs that were in that lineage had some kind of feathers on the forelimbs, often sort of like wings. So the fact that it has full-on wings wasn't actually that surprising. But it also has a ta big tail fan, feather, uh, uh, fan of ta uh, feathers on the tail, which inside you here looks very narrow, but it's actually really broad. I can pull up another picture in a moment. You can see that a little better. But more importantly, which I'm going to focus on at the moment, it has these big hind wing uh, feathers. Uh, so these quote-unquote hind wings are weird in that obviously you don't see them in modern birds, but also their positioning doesn't immediately or intuitively seem to be correct for a wing, where you expect that a wing would be something that you could hold transverse, could hold horizontally, basically. That's what people are used to, right? You hold them out to the, you hold your wings out to the side, the arms can do that. Turns out the hind limbs can't do that. Now, when this animal was first discovered and described in 2003, the author suggested that maybe somehow it could. They could somehow do a split. They could kind of spread, it, spread eagle at its hips to get those wings, those hind wings horizontal, and they suggested that it was two sets of, of wings supporting this animal, uh, so the animal's weight while gliding or something like that. Uh, and the joke I've made over the years is that, yes, it can do that once, and after which it'll never uh, walk or climb again. It has, to, <laughs> it's, it has to dislocate its hips to do it, basically, as far as we can tell. Now, there is some evidence that microraptorines might have slightly more mo mobile hips than other dinosaurs, which might be something to do with how they predated it, uh, prey or how they or maybe for climbing if they were partially arboreal, they lived in trees part of the time, stuff like that. Um, but they don't, there's no evidence that they could do a, a full-out split. And, and no, uh, no theropod dinosaurs we know of, including modern birds, can do that. It would be very strange if it could do that. And so that kind of created a conundrum for what you would do with these hind wings. And I should mention that it's not just the shape, but also the structure of the feathers, which indicates they probably were adapted to producing a, a, a fairly large amount of fluid force, i.e. they could produce a lot of lift. And also a fair amount of drag to go with that. Right. So that means that they're doing something, we think they're doing something sort of aerodynamically relevant. Uh, and and that, that feature, by the way, of the feathers is that they're asymmetric. So if you look at a feather, you have, a, you have a, what's called a rachis down the middle, um, and then you have the, the two veins on either side, right? It looks kind of like a little leaf. But if you grab most flight feathers, the one side is more narrow than the other. They're asymmetric. And there's not a lot of reason to be asymmetric. There's not a lot of utility in being asymmetric unless it's, it's a lift-generating foil, so when they're asymmetric, we usually assume that there's selection um, on the feathers for lift production. In any case, uh, what the team that I'm leading has, suge has is suggested instead, I've given a couple presentations on this, and the papers uh, should, should be out in the near future, probably the next couple of months, we're hoping all goes well, um, is that what's happening is that they're using everything right in the position basically you see here, that, it, that it's basically flying using the arms either for most of the weight support and or maybe some propulsion if it could flap. We don't know if it could be a flapping flyer yet uh, yet or not. We don't know. But the, the, the hind wings were just tucked up under the body like they would normally be or slightly extended like you see here in a walk out of a standing position. And then they were using them instead as control structures. So lift doesn't have to point up. It's a tendency because of the, the way we call it. We call it lift because it's often because airplanes use it to stay up. But lift can actually point in any direction you want. It, it's defined relative to the airflow and the and the wing slash air, airfoil things like that. Not um, specifically, really, the, the flow of the fluid. Not the direction relative to the ground. So you can produce lift sideways, for example. That's still lift. Right. And if you produce lift sideways off. If, as far as this animal is concerned, laterally, as we would say as anatomists, off these, because they're behind both the center of lift and center of mass, of, from this, uh, of center of mass of the animal, center of lift from the main wings, it would have a tendency to either make the animal spin side to side, what we call yaw, or spin about its long axis from its nose to its tail, what we call roll. So we tend to roll it or yaw it. I actually would do a little both. And both those things help you turn, right. particularly roll. So in fact, in flying, you, you turn by rolling, as opposed to driving, for example, where a roll occurs as a result of a turn, especially a sharp turn. 
right? So, you know, NASCAR, they bank the track to help keep them on the track because they're going to naturally roll when they turn really sharply. But for flying animal, it's the other way around. By rolling, it makes them turn. And so this animal generates more roll than it would otherwise with the, with, with the hind limb feathers here. That helps it turn. It, we, we are proposing that that was an adaptation for increased maneuverability, which would make sense in this animal because it, we know it lived in forests. And we know that the, that the main wings, the, 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 the standard wings, the four wings, um, four is an F-O-R-E, not four is in the number four. The four wings uh, were, you know, decently long, but they're not particularly strong. The bones in them don't appear to have been very stiff by, uh, if you compare them to, say, a living bird that lives in forests. So it has a, it has a for mechanical force problem. Um, there's a very real chance that if it tried to sustain a really sharp turn, all, all the forces that go into it, you think about how hard it is to do a cutting move if you're running or something like that, if or those are or athletes. Um, that's a really hard. It's a much that's harder on your legs than just running straight. It's the same thing here. It'd be harder on its arms to make a sharp cut. That it may not be able to sustain that. And then, in fact, it might not be able to turn hard enough to avoid a tree just using the arms. But if the legs are very powerful, in fact, stronger than the than the than the arms, which is not surprising because that's typically the case for these kinds of dinosaurs, these little manoraptorin, velociraptor-like dinosaurs. And so this, what we're proposing is that what we have here is, is a solution to a timing conundrum. That is, how do you get all of the, the flight muscle structures and everything selected for in an animal that's a flapping flyer and also uh, have all the control features that it needs in order to control its flight, how do you get that all simultaneously? And the answer is, well, it doesn't. It gets to control features first. Then you can get expansion of the of the main flight power apparatus up front. And the way that you can do that, you can separate that in time, is by initially having feathers develop on the hind limbs, with, which are already strong because they have running ancestors, and have feathers uh, on the tail, which allows you to control pitch, and then Later, uh, what we find is that the hind, the hind wings reduce in, in true birds, uh, essentially, because probably because their chest and arms have strengthened enough to compensate for the, for the problem. That's really fascinating. What, I, what I'm really loving about this, too, is you know, I, I'm not a biologist at all, um, <laughs> but I'm very familiar with having to do things in aerospace engineering. And so when you're, you're, you're bringing up my jargon, which I love, um, it's, it's, it's really great seeing how Thanks. the fields are, are blending there. And so where I would, I would typically not think I have anything related to paleontology or any study of, of ancient birds or modern birds for, for that, for that matter. But there, there is a lot going on and you're going into things like fluid dynamics. And so having an understanding of, having a good basis of general science is huge for no matter what field you're going into. And, you know, people think, oh, well, I'll never need physics if I'm going into biology. No, that's, that's not true. It oh, yeah, is, sure. the, is the, you know, the foundation of everything that's going on. It just depends on which direction you're going into. And I'm really loving to see the, the, the mechanics coming out here when, when you're talking, you know, I'm thinking I'm talking to a paleontologist today. I'll, I'm, it's going to be a little weird for me to try to come up with something to talk about. But you're going into fluid dynamics and talking about the mechanics of flight, it's really awesome. And finding Thanks. different ways that these these fields are able to come together, and people can find things interesting where they typically wouldn't think. Like, oh, well, dinosaurs. I, yeah. I do so with space all the time, so I have nothing in common <laughs> with them yet, besides Actually, maybe the timeline. <laughs> there you go. Actually, relating to um, what you were just saying, um, Michael did a really awesome series for Science Sunday for the past few weeks, and it's all these amazing hypothetical thought experiments about the mechanics of sailing in Titan or flying on Mars and things like that. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that for the people who didn't read all those posts, just to sure. refresh. Yes, that sounds awesome. Thanks very much. Yeah, no, that was fun. You know, it, it started, it started uh, amusingly enough, as a kind of a dare from a couple of my other uh, colleagues on Google Plus. Uh, we had, we <laughs> I were think in the I comments. know who. Yeah, I think you know exactly who. Um, it was started. It was we got some kind of comments going. We were had one of our conversations going in someone else's comment threads, and then uh, they dared me to. They, I mentioned I could do this, and they said, "Well, you should, you should do it. Give it a whirl." So I started with flying on Mars because uh, that was kind of the original conversation. 
And the problem with flying on Mars, the advantage of flying on Mars, of course, is that if you can make something that flies on Mars, you can survey a lot of ground on Mars very quickly. Um, and, the, and it's nice, it's a nice in-between, right? We can put rovers on it, we can put satellites around it, but it'd be nice to have something that's in-between, it's close up to the ground to see it really well, but it isn't on it so it can transit quickly. Right. The problem is Mars doesn't have much of an atmosphere. Uh, it's, it's very thin compared to, compared to Earth, but it does it have Just enough to be a pain. <laughs> just enough to be a pain, yes. Right. Just enough to be a pain. But from my perspective, someone who works on, on flapping flight, it has just enough possible to work. Uh, because the one way of looking at it is, oh, well, it's, a really, it's, it's really thin, so you have to go really fast. And so the problem is we could make air breathing, typical air breathing engine driven aircraft that could fly on, but they had to go so, you know, fixed wings, they had to go so fast that they would never be able to land, right? So they would just whirl, whirl around until their fuel ran out and crash. Uh, it would be look awesome, but it wouldn't be very productive. Well, you know, you get A for effort and style points. Style points are always <laughs> style I mean, points. Are huge. See what you know what MSL did. Come on, no, there's just some style points right there with the seven minutes of terror. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But um, regardless, uh, there is a, there's another way of looking at this, which is looking at it sort of from a physics perspective. What you could say is, oh, the problem is that the Reynolds number on Mars. Uh, is really low for a given craft compared to what it would be on Earth. So I'll explain what I mean by that. There's something called the Reynolds number that summarizes the inertial forces to what we call the viscous forces. It's basically how sticky does the air feel. And at high Reynolds numbers, it doesn't feel very sticky. Things are mostly inertia. You, you have the throw and it pretty much goes through it the way that you, you pushed it. You know? And big aircraft that we typically build uh, work mostly in a very high Reynolds number regime. They go very fast. Um, the, the flow around them is what we call very turbulent, et cetera. Um, and so they're a very high Reynolds number. And one of the things that goes in there is the density of the medium. So the denser the air is, the higher the Reynolds number goes as well. And the lower the density is, the lower Reynolds numbers go. So Mars has a low, it tends to push things into a low Reynolds number regime because it's got thin atmosphere. So what you can do instead of saying, well, how fast can we make it go and somehow try to land? We can say instead, oh, is there anything on Earth that flies in a low Reynolds number regime already? And the answer is yes, there are. In fact, animals mostly fly in much lower Reynolds number regimes than aircraft do. Right. So a bird, a little bird or something, flies in, it, it, the air feels stickier to it. And if you go down to an insect like a moth or even like a little beetle or something, it gets even stickier still. So these are animals that are all, these are flying systems that are already adapted to flying in something that feels sticky. And so it turns out, if you work some of the math out, hypothetically at least, if you take something sort of like a moth-ish kind of flyer, and you make it a little bit bigger, you know, actually a fair bit bigger and faster, but not so big and fast that it's, you know, a missile now, basically. Right. So um, it's not the puffin on Mars, right? It's not the puffin on Mars, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The Mars yeah. puffin. Uh, you can, <laughs> You can get something that hypothetically should fly pretty well on Mars, and I worked out some numbers. And you can do this very, very elegantly. With you can, I actually have the, the frequency functions. I can look for where they cross to find the solutions. I just did it iteratively just to get a, a one shot at uh, one solution that worked. But you got something that kind of flat, sort of like a moth, but because it was on Mars, it was about the size and speed of a duck. Right. Which is pretty fast as animals yeah. go, but it's but it's very landable. Oh, absolutely. Like you, can, you can work with that. Like you know, you, you can you can you can land and launch this thing now. This is this is now no this is now tractable, and so that was the idea behind the the flying on Mars. Post. No, that's really awesome. Um, especially since you know I was at JPL when when the uh, Mars rover, uh, the most recent Mars rover landed, and you know you become familiar with how slow these rovers really are. Not only because you have to stop and do science while you're out there, you can't just go drag racing on Mars, even though that would be awesome. But you no, know, there is a limit to what you can traverse on ground, and so that's that's a really interesting concept, actually, even to journey down is you know what let's fly around you know we do have the the mars reconnaissance order uh, orbiter and we have mars express and things like that going about but having a, a flyer there that's a really uh, really neat vein to go down to and start thinking about it's that's really cool especially going into the fluid dynamics there and going to with the reynolds number and what you would have to do as far as scaling it to to, to dealing with how to fly on mars without you know, without burning and crashing, because that was that was a big problem with the Curiosity landers. That you you there was just enough that you would burn up on entry, 
there's just enough air there <laughs> yeah. that it causes so much friction that you you burn up on entry. So you you did have to have a, a lander come in with a heat shield and you couldn't just soar it in. But then there's not enough to fly. So you had to have retro thrusters and you had to find a way to slowly land on it. So it's a big pain. So I, I think that's that would be an interesting thing to see happen in the future and what would happen if we can end up flying on Mars, especially in the next most likely 50 years we start sending humans to Mars and what would happen with that, dealing with the mass that would be able to be allowable on there or something like that. So right. I'm finding and this interesting as the as a token astronomer in this hangout. So I will There you go, it. there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in fact, one thing, one thing I, will, I will mention as well, if, you know, if, you know, say, say 50 years putting someone on Mars, one nice thing about having a smaller flapping flight robot like that is they might be hand launchable. So now you have something you can that you can take around Mars, and you don't know what's on the other side of that crater, and you really don't want to hike over there on your own. Right. <laughs> and you you, so you give your handy robot a chuck, and it goes and it checks it out, and it comes back. You right. Know, it's, uh, it, it, I mean, that's already something we kind of do here. Of uh, there are some hand launching military uh, uh, aerial vehicles that are used that it would help them with search and rescue and surveillance and things like that. But those are basically just little mini planes or fixed wing. Kinds of, kinds yeah, of uh, I was using some of those at uh, Cal Poly Pomona um, mm -hmm. like a year and a half ago of doing with some UAV testing. But yeah, some of the fixed wing there, yeah, you just throw them and you, you, know, you start going there and you, a lot of times you can have them automated already so they can go and do where they need to do and come on back. So it's, there's a, a lot of really cool technology and again, it's, it's awesome and how it's tying into with your, with your field. I'm, I'm, I'm loving to see the connections going on there and that, you know, though it's so easy to become specified and very specific in your field, but thinking, hey, there's so many connections that we can work together and collaborate and, and come up with some really neat ideas where you typically wouldn't if you're just stuck in your little niche all the time. So yeah. right, right. That, it's a great thing. And lots of applications as well. Maybe NASA is watching this. Maybe. Oh, maybe well, well, in fact, I gave a talk <laughs> at Lockheed on Friday. Okay. Oh, awesome. so it's uh, like Martin at the Skunk Works. Yeah, it's not it's not that uncommon for me to give talks for that sort of uh, venue. I used to give guest lectures in the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University because right. uh, I was in Pittsburgh for three years. Uh, that was my first faculty job. Was out there, and then I I, I got uh, hired by by a USC. Uh, they sort of uh, headhunted me out, which is kind of funny. Um, but in any case, and the warm weather didn't hurt. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I mean it was. I mean, so I've, I've been in that that realm before, and I enjoy talking to that kind of audience, and they have a good time. I, one of the things, I, I've been, I've given two talks in the last few months, so the one on Friday and one uh, in the late fall, uh, where it was for audiences that weren't familiar with, you know, were interested in applications, but were not familiar with sort of, especially the paleontological view. And I said, yeah. you know, I said one thing I get asked a lot is, why do I do what I do in terms of paleontology? Why are we, why is there interest in giant flying animals in the Mesozoic or something? I said, well, there's two reasons. One is, <coughs> it's just intrinsically cool. Quite frankly, at the end of the day, you know, our general human curiosity is what makes it worth getting up in the morning, in my view anyway, and this is something people want to know, so I'm happy to help them figure it out. But there's another reason too, which is, well, a lot of what we learn from animals for potential design, a lot of what it comes down to really is shape and interactions between shapes, the, what we call morphology in, in biology. Well, as a paleontologist, I have 99.9% .9 of the morphologies. Because that's how many animals are, that's the percentage of the animals and plants and other organisms that are extinct. The vast majority of, you know, we only have a small fraction of this, so we hold ourselves to just looking at the solutions now. We miss a lot right, of solutions yeah. that existed, many of which were very successful solutions. They only went extinct because of some uh, events or event that was unrelated to their ability to fly well. Right, there's like many that. variables yeah. involved that could have happened, had that happen yeah. there. Right, exactly. You know, you get massive ocean acidification, your shell melts and you die. It doesn't mean it wasn't a good shell, it just means that you can't make shells yeah. in acid oceans. And so, uh, you know, we, it's interesting to know, we don't want to just look at living shell types, we want to look at fossil ones. The same thing with wings. You know, we have three groups of powered flyers alive today amongst animals. We have, um, not counting humans, with our, our cybernetic approach to flight, if you will, um, which would be insects birds and bats, but there's a fourth one, which is pterosaurs. The pterosaurs did things differently from the way the other three did. And if we exclude them, we've taken out a quarter, basically, of the wing diversity in, in the list, because yeah, they had a whole completely different kind of wing that was better at some things and worse at other things than the other three are. And as a paleontologist, I look at all four, because they're all four to be equally interesting and viable 
sorts of uh, uh, sources of inspiration. So are, are you seeing that there was a, a common trait that is no longer available now with, with I guess, modern birds than you're seeing with the more ancient birds and the, the dinosaurs there? Are you seeing some traits that did die out for some sort of, um, it, just some sort of natural selection that just, it's much better with what we're, you know, what it's being able to be used for now than as it could have been beforehand? Uh, yes, actually. So. You see, so in the Mesozoic, for example, which is where I spent a lot of my time, but not all of it, um, there are two groups of, of, of powered flyers amongst vertebrates. There's three groups total. So you've got insects, no bats, yeah, at that time. You've got the early birds, and you have pterosaurs. And pterosaurs are well established at that point. And pterosaurs seem to have been doing a lot of things you don't see amongst modern animals, but that's just kind of pure dumb luck. The last pterosaurs died out with the last non-avian dinosaurs, that is, all the dinosaurs that weren't birds. And they probably, that probably had nothing to do with how they flew. That was probably just, a lot of them were big and being a big terrestrial or semi-terrestrial animal at the time was just not a good thing. Almost all those animals died regardless of the lifestyle and so they died too. Uh, and so what we see with them is flight characteristics that were probably would be just as good now if they made it to the extinction, but they didn't. But then if we look at the early birds and, and close relatives of birds, there we're seeing features where probably some of them wouldn't be as competitively um, advantageous now, but they were at the time because of where they were in their fossil history. So Microraptor would be a great example of that, which I was talking about earlier. The Microraptor solution to maneuverability, to have the hind wings and the tail fan carrying a lot of the, uh, a lot of the control authority, taking that load off of the main wings, off the, the arms, uh, is great for that animal because it's got kind of wimpy arms in terms of strength and stiffness, and it's got beefy, a beefy tail and beefy legs. But that's a really draggy way, being really colloquial here. It's a high drag way of Such doing Such a drag, it. man. Such a drag. It's a, high, <laughs> it's, a, it's a high drag solution. It's a high drag way of doing it. It's right. much better if you instead take all those extra hind limb feathers away, take, shorten the tail, get all the tail fan off, and just have a really robust, strong chest and set of arms and just use those wings for everything, which is what modern birds basically do. They do use their legs and their tail for a little bit of control authority, but it's not much. Um, it's really based on, on the wings. And we know, incidentally, that, that birds can get by with just using the wings because there are multiple species of birds, a handful of them, more than a handful, in fact, whose tails are reduced. So we see that a lot of them have a decent-sized tail, but a lot of, like Swiss, for example, which are great flyers, they have a highly reduced tail. They don't really use it in flight. They must use it to brace themselves against chimneys and stuff when they're roosting. So the, the modern bird morphology works really well with just the wings, which is the most efficient way of doing it. Right. Um, <laughs> but in order to get there... You've got to go from something that that didn't that had completely the wrong ratios in terms of strength of bone elements up to the modern case, and the only really way to make that work in evolutionary history is to already is get in the air in between somehow. So you've got to get into the air without the optimal case. And so I don't think Microraptor, for example, would necessarily do that well in the modern context, but where it, when it was uh, around, it did pretty well. Right. Um, it, it was alongside, uh, interestingly enough, it was surviving and competing alongside some more derived birds, because even though we think it might represent the more primitive state, it's a hanger on, it's kind of a, a last relic of this, this mode of flight. Um, and so it couldn't have been that competitively dis disastrous, but the thing was there weren't any hawk-like birds or anything at the time either. And, right. it, it was, and it was a big, it was like a crow-sized predatory animal. You put it in the modern world, and it's going to try to maneuver and catch prey alongside falcons and eagles, and it's going to get its butt kicked, probably. Right. Or become prey itself, you know. It, well, it's, very likely, yeah. Right. It seems, at least from the, the image there that you showed me, that it, it might have done something as far as jump and glide, you know, especially since it did have the strong hindquarters there. Did, did you, would it seem, you know, based on its anatomy there and the physiology going on with the bone structure, would it be advantageous for it to try to jump and glide from one place to the next if it's not quite going to a full flight, especially with its hindquarters? I, it might. It might have, in fact, it might have been doing a lot of unpowered flight, and that would be fine. Uh, but again, of course, it's kind of the same point holds because then you've got an unpowered flyer trying to compete with powered flyers, which is right. difficult. And, unpowered, and, there are, and there are unpowered flyers alive today that do just fine in terms of their lifestyles, but they're typically not competing directly with powered flyers for the, for the getting around part. Right. You know, uh, you know uh, flying snakes are not the best flyers around. They're awfully good flyers for not having any limbs. Uh, you can ask Jake Soka about that. 
and they're great for nightmares. You know, but what they're really what what they really have going for them is not that they're the best flyer; it's the fact that they're a really good snake and they can also fly, which turns right. out to be a really good combo. <laughs> um, and so you got to be good at something else. So you know, something like Microraptor might have been really actually a pretty good running, jumping kind of animal that could also fly some, and that could be a pretty good combo. In terms of the jumping, one thing that's worth noting is all flying animals, as far as we can tell, jump to jump or run to take off. In fact, mostly it's jumping. Even when it look like they're running, uh, like over the water, it's really kind of a series of hops, it looks like, for the most part. Okay. Um, so jumping is pretty ubiquitous, even amongst powered flyers. Uh, they use a jump to launch, and, and gliders as well. They, so, so having strong hind limbs turns out to be important as a flyer, regardless. Or, assuming you're bipedal, like a bird, or having strong walking limbs, like an insect, because they have wings and the limbs are separate. Or in the case of bats, it's important that their wings be strong enough to help push them off the ground in addition to flying. Um, and the ones that most, there's only a few bats that launch off the ground regularly, but those that do use their wings to really push themselves really hard. So jumping turns out to be an important part of all that. And it, has to, and it comes back to the physics. It comes back to the physics of flight that, that in fact, um, and I've worked a lot on animal launch. That's in fact where I kind of started in my, in my room. That was my, my dissertation and stuff. And it was, it was animal takeoff and stuff. And um, Turns out that, that if you just drop something off a cliff, you know, that was the old model for like big pterosaurs and stuff, you know, oh, you can just jump, drop off a cliff. I call that the, the lawn dart hypothesis. Because <laughs> right. that's basically what happens because you're, you're accelerating one gravity in the wrong direction upside down and you want to go a couple of G's that way. Um, so it's, it's actually a really bad way to take off. In fact, the most challenging launch strategy amongst animals alive today is probably cave dwelling bats. Right. right which are on a ceiling upside down and have to launch from that. That's actually the worst way of doing it. Like, it's really impressive that bats can do that. But there are hundreds and hundreds of actually, on probably, I mean, there's, what, 1,200 species of bats or something like, like uh, uh, last count, depending on which taxonomy you like, between 1,000 12, uh, 12, you know, 1,200 of them. And, like, probably half of those can do that, or more than half of those can do that. That's really impressive. That's a lot of animals that can do that. But Without crashing into each other as well. Yeah, without crashing yeah. each other, without, I mean, all yeah. kinds of things. It's unbelievable. But, yeah. but the, the, re, the, the, the more realistic reaction to that is, wow, that's really surprising that they can do that, not, oh, that's the easy way out. Yeah. Right. Which is why you don't see any any of the, the near flyers in the fossil record that looked like they were doing that, or any of the any of the unpowered flyers, none of them do that. You know, um, the closest are Dermopterans, which are these kind of primate-like, lemur-like things uh, that mm -hmm. have that have gliding membranes, and they hang upside down on branches, a suspensory, but they still have to poke, pull themselves up and kind of push off the branch in order to glide, and, and it's pretty complicated. They flip around, so. It's a difficult thing to do. It's a way easier to do it the way that birds stuff do it, which is just to jump up yeah. and to fly. So you were saying that you had some samples to show us, including human bones in your house. Oh, so. I, I do, I do. So tell you what, I'm going to. I, I see that my charge is getting a little low, so I'm going to take a, take us on a little trip here, if that's all right, <laughs> and plug in here, and then we're going to I'm going to pull out some some human. Uh, Human stuff, and and I, I'm going to use it as well as a is a is a hiding the bodies. Or... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm going to use and it. Going into a chest freezer. Yes. Yeah, so I know I'll use it as a little bit of a uh, as a as a way of chatting about uh, differences between human anatomy and the anatomy of some of the animals I work on. Okay. And incidentally, one thing to mention as well, it's, it's speaking of live animals and anatomy, I do have some other crazy animals around here if anyone really wants to see them later. We've got, um, we have, let's see, animals I can pull out. If, uh, I've, got a, I've got a python, I've got two milk snakes over here, got some geckos, got a turtle. Good times. Uh, <laughs> did I mention I live in a zoo? Yeah, okay. Nice. <laughs> So something that's kind of that's kind of I get asked this a lot in museums, so I thought this was a good uh, this might be a good one to to hit with uh, hit first. So first of all, I'll go ahead and meet my meet my friend here, number thirteen. <laughs> Does he this, have a name? Um, I, I call him Davy. Davy. Uh, as in Davy Jones, right. uh, and the reason is because he was originally stored in a locker. <laughs> um, Love it. Uh, in any case, so this is it was original. It is actually Davy Jones too. There was the original Davy Jones at my, when I worked in Pittsburgh, and there was this the, the next Davy Jones. Um, but in any case, this is a real human skull. And one thing, so I'll make sure it gets a little bit above my uh, my tagline there at the bottom. So you probably recognize the features, right? So these are what we call the orbits. That's where the eyes go. Of course, and this is this would be the oral compartment here. That's the nasal opening there. One thing I get asked a lot is when people are looking at dinosaurs.
festivals I work on, you know, often they go to the museum, they look at these things, and they, and they start counting holes, and they can't figure out where the eye goes because they find there's an extra hole in the skull. And they're absolutely right. There is an extra hole in the skull. It's called an ant orbital fenestra. An ante, like ante up in poker, before, right, in front of. So it's in front of the orbit. So they have an extra hole between the nose and the orbit. So they have an extra hole right here. But because they have a long snout, that hole's often really big. So if you look at a skull of a tyrannosaur, so if anyone out there, you know, go to the L.A. Museum of Natural History. And by the way, if anyone's in the L.A. area, I, I'm at the Natural History Museum, research associate there, work there on a regular I'll basis. I'll be right over. So uh, <laughs> I, I give tours there occasionally so we can hang out be good. All right. But you look at like the tyrannosaurus rex skull, for example, would be a great one. You, see, you can see where the nostrils are. Then you're going to count back two holes to get to the eye. There'll be a big hole and then a smaller hole. The smaller hole is where the eye goes. Small hole in front where the nose goes, and there's this big hole in the middle, and that's that extra opening that we don't have. Right. Now, there's two other holes. This is kind of fun as well. There's two other holes in the back of the skull. Two pairs, actually. So two on the top, two on the sides. Those are called temporal fenestra. And we are descended from a group that only has one of those. They're called synapsids. And things like tyrannosaurs and birds and lizards are all diapsids. They have two pairs. Two, right. Yeah. Now, we still have our one. It's just in a weird place now. It's not up on top of our head because our, our, our skull's gotten so vaulted up for that big brain we use for cool things like Science Sunday Hangouts. Uh, ours is now right here, behind your cheekbone, basically. So this space under here, under what we call the zygomatic arch, this, this space under your cheekbone, there's actually a hole okay. under there. Yeah. That used to be up here. If you and it's and if you look at the reptile, the reptile type animals, basically what exactly a reptile is is up to debate. But the reptilian yeah. type of animals that are mammalian ancestors, this hole was way up on top of the skull, but it's migrated. Right. So, is, well, it has to do with changes in the brain size and okay. changes in the biting structure. Right. Um, so it's a combination of those two combined, basically. And so it start. It was always anchoring jaw muscles, and then as the brain case changes, they, the jaw muscles have to reorient. Yeah. Um, so that it's still there. What that tells us is that we're synapses, and we see this in all the other mam living mammals, or whatever. So we're synapses. So we have this one opening one. What's kind of cool is there's a. If you look at in the fossil record, and you look at other animals in that lineage, they're not what you'd expect. They didn't always look very mammalian, of course. You know, Dimetrodon, the thing with a big sail on its back and the crazy teeth forever. I, I think I have a good picture of one here, in fact. That is close related, more related, it's more closely related to you or I or any other human alive now, for example, than it is to, ty to a Tyrannosaurus rex. It gets called a dinosaur all the time, but it isn't. It's actually yeah. in the same lineage, which is pretty cool. That is so, really cool. Anyway, so that's kind of a... That's that's a fun one. That's a fun, fun example. Um, I don't know. Is anyone is anyone out there have any questions about any human anatomy or non-human anatomy for that matter? Yeah, we have a bunch of questions. So okay. Well, up. questions about anything are great, and I've got the skull here. If anyone has any questions about that, go for okay. it. Okay. Um, let me pull it up. Um, you can talk about other skulls in the meantime. Sorry. Other skulls. Let's hear about all your skulls you have over there, Michael. The All my connection. How many skulls do you have in your apartment? In my apartment, at the moment, just the one. That's so unfortunately I don't have any others to pull out. But in my office, I also have a, I have a python skull. I've got three different bat skulls. I've got a pink. I got a penguin skeleton. I've got a crow skeleton. That's just in my office. Um, and then of course, my other office is in the Museum of, Museum of Natural History, and then we have hundreds of them. Uh, right. We have all kinds of different stuff there that, that I work on on a regular basis. Um, everything from sharks to giant marine lizards, from the Mesozoic to dinosaurs to birds to all, you know, all sorts of things. So I, I spend a lot of time in the company of death. As one should. Of, as one yeah. should. Uh, you feel more alive. When exactly, exactly. Well, I, and what I mentioned before, I do teach human anatomy from, in the medical school, which means I do teach cadaver-based anatomy. Right. So, and in fact, this is a teaching specimen. That's why I have. That's why I have it here. I have it. I have. I have a. I'm actually stored stored here for legitimate reasons, just so no one out there is confused or what have you. Um, this is a, This is on loan to me personally from USC for me to use because I, uh, I I teach at both campuses, both the medical campus and the main campus, mostly the medical one, and I live in between the two, and so it was easier for me to have one here to take. And, and it's easier to say that than how you actually got your position there, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's gotcha. much easier. Yeah. Much, much easier to say. Although it is interesting. One thing I do get asked a lot is the legal aspects of, of, of you know, transporting human, human bones remains. and such. Human yeah. And the reality is human remains overall are very tightly regulated, probably as they right. should be. 
But skeletal remains are surprisingly not in many ways. Um, they're easy, it's easier to buy and sell in such a new ways, at least from adults. Juvenile remains are different, but for adults it's actually fairly simple. Um, but, uh, and you can buy, there are companies where you can buy research grade skeletons from. Now, that said, no, for people thinking out there, getting fast ideas now, no, you can't just go onto them and just anyone buy it. <laughs> you, you, you have to be, for example, a professor at a medical school or some other registered individual. So no bones um, are us to just yeah, bones are us, no. no. <laughs> well, for, but for me, it almost is. I mean, that's the thing. Like, I, can order, I, can, I can order a human skeleton and have it here at the end of the week, and it would be mine. Like, I could buy it my personal funds, and I would own it. Uh, but it would only be legal for me to purchase and have so long as I continued to be an anonymous working at educational institutions, basically. Right. Um, but that said, <laughs> there's no paperwork or permit involved. There's no permits. Uh, like, you know, if I, wow. you know, I can, I can take this thing on the train to work or whatever, <laughs> and there's nothing, there's no, there's, there's nothing there. So it's, it's kind of a weird kind of circumstance. Uh, and I, just, I found it. I found it has surprised a lot of people that expected that it would be more tightly regulated than it is. Um, and and in many ways, it isn't. I will mention, though, again, before anyone gets any fast ideas out there, <laughs> even if you are legitimate anatomical instructor of some kind, and if you do get some real human bone great, for teaching purposes, great, more power to you. I will warn you, people like TSA don't believe you when you tell them that there is no permit required for transporting these things. Well, you, you shouldn't be carrying a femur with you when you're walking through LAX. And, you know, yes. ju just saying, you know, th and many people don't understand the size of a human femur. It's, yes. it, you know, it's, a, it's just a decent bone. And, uh, it's a good club. I, I've, you know, I've got a medical history. I, I used to run EMS back in Detroit, and okay. yes, the, the femur is 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 quite the regulator if you want to use it as a weapon. That's a that's a hefty little bone that you got going on. There so, you yeah. go. Absolutely, absolutely. We had a um, back in the day. So I used to with a couple of guys run a historical um, close combat club, kind of like Western sword kind of stuff mostly, and. Um, and one of the dudes uh, in the club, we, we were making up some, uh, we, were, we were building some some uh, training apparatus, and he made something as a stand-in. It was his first go. It was pretty ugly. It just kind of looked like a big padded club, basically. And we nicknamed it the cat, the uh, camel femur. <laughs> Uh, as a result, and it was actually surprisingly effective, even though it was ugly as sin. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, oh god, here he comes with his camel femur again! Run, run! I, I don't think it needs to be pretty to to womp someone on the head. I'm nope. Just... <laughs> no, no, nope. it was good times. But anyway, so, so you said we had some questions. Yeah, I found the question. Uh, Great. This one's from Sil Silvan Westby, and he says, "How many times has the evolution of flight appeared in vertebrates?" Pterosaurs, dinosaurs, birds, bats. Do we count gliders like flying fish and flying squirrels? Do you know of other extinct lines of species that could fly? Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, great, yeah. great question. So, in terms of powered flyers, we have uh, within vertebrates. We have we know of two. Uh, or excuse okay. me, we know of, know of uh, three. No, three. Sorry, I was just the guys from We got three of them. There might be four. Okay. So we've got we've got pterosaurs, birds, and bats. There might, as uh, as our astute asker of questions noted, there may in fact be another one within dinosaurs that didn't lead to birds. So Microraptor, for example, might represent the ancestral state going to birds, or it might yeah. be a separate powered flyer uh, origin within dinosaurs. Okay. So dinosaurs have done it at least once. We call that one birds. There might have they might have done it another time too. We don't know, but because we don't can't tell yet if those animals are actually leading two birds, or should still make it the one time, or if there are if, it, or if it, they were you know you get close enough to the threshold and you start getting it happening multiple times. Pterosaurs seems to have only happened once, and bats seems to have only happened once as far as we can tell. So we don't have any other examples of powered flight evolving anywhere actually, other than the insect example, which of course uh, we all know about. So there aren't any there aren't any fossil groups other than pterosaurs that have powered flight that don't have any living representatives. As for gliders, though, there's a lot of different, uh, there's a lot of cases where those show up for you know, what we call you know, gliding animals, uh, what I call unpowered flyers, to be a little more precise. So these are animals that do not flap their wings in order, in order to fly. And there are a lot of those, both in the fossil record and alive today. So there's multiple groups of mammals. Some marsupials have done it a couple of times, probably. Rodents have done it a few times. Um, snakes have done it at least once. 
Uh, frogs have done it at least once, probably a couple of times. Uh, lizards have done it a few times. Some other reptiles, some lizard-like things that weren't true lizards in the fossil record also did it. So there's some independent examples there, like Icarosaurus, which is one of my favorites, named for Icarus from the Icarus, yeah. Icarus and Daedalus awesome. uh, myth, which is cool. So he's cool. That's a tri uh, Triassic animal, Triassic glider. It was kind of cool. It looked a little bit like modern Draco Volans, uh, which are these lizards that have ribs that come out and extend a, a wing membrane, but theirs was longer. Uh, so it's what we call higher aspect ratio. So the wingspan was longer, so these super long waves, kind of fun. Um, there are, and so yeah, so, and then, then you see, yeah, you see it amongst, uh, uh, like I said, the Dermopterans or another weird group where you get Unpowered Flight. So Unpowered Flight shows up uh, quite often. Interestingly enough, none of them seem to be particularly closely related to any of the Powered Flyers. Right. Which is interesting. So you, you don't find, so it may not be the Powered Flight really comes to a really nice unpowered gliding phase the way that we might have expected because you don't ever see them closely related. Though we don't know that, but that sort of, sort of seems to to, to be indicative thereof. So I think that I think I, did I hit all the points in the question there. I think I did. Yeah, yeah I think, pretty much. Yeah, so. <laughs> uh, I've got one over here from Twitter. Actually, I'm going to put it up mm. here on the screen. It's from um, David Todd Howard. Howard, excuse me. So I wonder what modern aircraft design has taken from either prehistoric or present-day avian creatures. You know, wing design, control, etc. Now I, I know that you mentioned that you uh, have given talks over at Lockheed, and mm -hmm. you know there's many places over here in California, like Northrop Grumman and things like that, that are dealing with with engineering of this type. Is have do you know of anything that's um, directly related to either you know to actually let's start with prehistoric, then maybe some modern birds. So the answer is yes. There are some there are some modern examples. Um, but and before I, I get into that, I, one thing it's worth mentioning though that might al that also I think addresses the question from from our, our listener is that uh, about twenty years ago the answer would have been not really. So in the era of manned aircraft, only at the broadest level were animals really an inspiration for aircraft design. They were an inspiration in the sense that they showed us that big things can get in the air. Right, I mean, it was very important to the Wright brothers to have seen birds flying around because it told you that it could happen. Right, yeah. there are animals made of the same stuff we're made out of, and <clears throat> so we know that they can't generate that much power, and they're in the air and they're flying, so it can be done. And some basic things about how a wing works came out of studying those sorts of things. But in terms of real sophisticated modern design, no. A guy who who or a woman who works on you know, designing the, the, the replacement for the 747 or something, you know, for the next large commercial aircraft. Um, actually, they are already replacing for the 747. So <laughs> the individuals who, who did that work didn't have to know a lot about animal flight. But the reason why the answer has changed, the reason why the answer is now yes, is because a lot of modern, really like modern the last decade or so, designs are focused on unmanned aerial vehicles. Right. Right. And that pushes you down into a size realm in some cases that where it's now applicable. And that's the reason why the designs were so different before. We're trying to care, carry a person on board, especially multiple people. Uh, we were forced into making aircraft that were very large, way larger than any flying animals. I mean, even the big pterosaurs that I like working on so much, I mean, yeah, they were big for flying animal. People always gasp when I show them pictures and things. But they aren't that big as, as, as compared to a vehicle that we built. I mean, the, the biggest ones were 500 some pounds probably when they were alive. Right. And that's not that big for, I mean, you, know, you compare that to even small, maneuverable, tr more traditional aircraft like, you know, like a, 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 a jet propelled fighter, for example, something like the F 22. I mean, I think it's multiple, t many tons, you know. And so that turns out to be a real difference. But now the, we got these small things, and now they're flying in regimes that are more, more like animals. And so, yes, the, there, there are some examples. Um, I'm trying to think what some of the best ones would be. There's a lot of it is just things that are ongoing research. Uh, there's a lot of interest in aeroelasticity, for example. So this is what happens when you have something that, that where the, the forms under ten, under tension of the air pressure differences as it produces lift and drag. Uh, and and one of the good basic examples of that are membrane wings. And so bats do that. Pterosaurs once had to deal with that as well. And so there's a really good group at Brown, for example, that looks at the material properties of bat wings. And that's been looked at in terms of morphine materials for more, or better morphine wings in aircraft. Uh, that that some of that is being taken into account in some uh, some uh, prototypes, which I can't talk too much about. <laughs> so you're not going to see them flying around yet, but you will at some point. Okay, so there's some of that that comes into play. It doesn't be first principles, rather than directly like we made this wing look like a bird wing. So space dinosaurs, what you're saying? 
<laughs> Clear Space Nine Swords, yeah. Gotcha. Um, but there's other things too. Um, oh, uh, splitting wings. So you'll if you watch a Vulture Sword, um, uh, what it can do, Vultures can split their, their tips. They can do slotting. They split them like look like fingertips. Uh, split the, the feathers. So um, that kind of slotting and split tip designs and things like that for very low speed flight is is potential inspiration. And again. When, it's, when you use it on the aircraft, you don't necessarily build it the same way. So it doesn't mean you're going to see something that looks like a vulture wing that has literally split tips. But you can get the same dynamic in other ways. And the dynamic came from understanding how the vulture does it. Really so, awesome. so, there are, so those are a couple ones that come to mind. Um, one that I can talk a little bit more about that I have some direct involvement in because I've been consulting on it a little bit is NASA funded, is trying to make a multimodal uh, robot. So, and specifically a robot that can both jump and fly. And that's not something that we typically do with aircraft at all. They tend, they're always taxiing uh, or catapult launched from a carrier, basically, which is basically a really fast taxi. I mean, it's still right. real. <laughs> um, uh, they sort of launching, and, but animals, as I mentioned earlier, do that all the time. Flying animals do that all the time. That's, that's how they take off is jump. And they want this, the reason NASA's interested in this thing is they're interested in putting a flapping flyer on Mars. As per our previous conversations, the numbers I had run. Um, and they're interested in having this thing be able to also land and look around on the ground, but then get out of a crater or some other tough spot by being able to jump. Right. And if you're jumping, it would be good because you not only initiate flight, but also with the lower gravity environment on Mars, jumping gets you a little further. Right. So it's not as power intensive. So, there's, so there's, there's, there are some robots, uh, especially for, for space exploration, that sort of thing, that are more biomimetic. In terms of modern aircraft, you're not going to see anything that you're going to probably, or at least not for a long time, that you're going to look at and be like, oh, my God, that looks just like Animal X. But there's subtle things in it that were taken from, from an animal, we understand, about morphine wings and passive deformation of, of control structures and, and surface effects, boundary layer effects. So that, uh, birds and bats use feathers and fur, respectively, in order to control the boundary layer of the air against their body in various ways. And there's certain parts of their wings that are feathered or furred differently than others for that reason. And so we can learn from that as well. We're not going to put feather and furs on the aircraft, but we might oh, also... We totally should. We should. <laughs> we should. I was thinking... Pimp I was thinking, my aircraft. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. Yes, yes. Can, can I have a but, furry Airbus? And, <laughs> That would be that would be fantastic. Yo, oh man, I'm, I'm thinking. I think we got, I think we have a whole business line in this. Yes, yeah, it's so it's fantastic. You you get on you get on your furry you get in your furry jetliner and it's kind of bouncing to, to a heavy base. As you get on. Everything and, comes with mink, you know, as a high end over there. Yeah, exactly. And everything on board is an animal print inside. <laughs> and then Peta is going to hate us right now. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, well. sorry, Peter. Yeah, it's hypothetical. <laughs> uh, we're not gonna. We're, 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 we, don't, we won't condone that, uh, unless it's faux fur, in which case I'm totally on board. Okay, yeah, yeah it's faux fur. Yeah, yeah. But it, it'll look great, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, but in any case, you're not. Yes, you're not actually gonna put things like that on the airplane, of course. But you can. You can do other things to their surface using materials we use in order to, to get the same boundary layer effects. Yeah. Right. And and that's like when I gave a lot of key talk. One of the things I mentioned was, you know, I said, you know, I'm not here to argue to you that you should be mimicking animals directly. What I'm telling you is the animals have done some things very well, which we currently don't do very well, and we have the advantage of having materials they don't have to work with. So we should be able to do it even better still if we really put our right. minds to it. The trick is just finding out what those principles are. They've had the advantage of being able to do lots and lots and lots of trial and error. Yeah. Over a very long time. <laughs> Over a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. So you get. You know, it, 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 there are certain problems that are better solved in an evolutionary way than in an expertise way. That's right. right. That. There's also a lot of problems the other way around. There's a lot of problems where you should just get a trained expert and have them just figure it out rather than try to evolve the answer. And one of the reasons is because evolving the answer is wasteful. You lose a lot of things along the way. A lot of, there's a lot of failures that don't work. Yeah. Right. But, um, but it's very good for searching space that you, that you normally wouldn't search. You wouldn't even think to look in. Well, and it'll that's, stumble in there. Right. You start seeing the the, the benefits of both sides because, yeah, it is wasteful. But then you also find out things that you never knew before, and you create brand new areas of research just because you went down the wrong path for your question, but yeah. you've opened up four more questions. And so you're yeah. able to you know, have a brand new research arena just because you happen to go down the wrong path for your answer doesn't mean that there's other research that can't be done to help answer other questions. So on that's, the advantage exactly is right. the variation. So yes. you have lots of variation, and that's the benefit to adapt to changing circumstances. 
Right, absolutely. A, a great example on the current topic, just to serve a tangible example of that, um, is humans have a tendency, have had a tendency historically to get stuck in really worrying about having as high a lift of drag ratio as possible. We're always trying to minimize drag because the kinds of things we typically build, drag is always kind of bad. It's like you, drags your cost and you're just trying to minimize it because you streamline as things as much as you can or you, you make surfaces stick less or you know whatever you can do to get drag down. And animals don't do that. And at first, it just looks like, well, I guess they're just not as good at it because you know, we've got all these materials. We're so much better than these birds. Jeez, yeah. <laughs> right. you know, and then when you realize that a lot of the things they do, they are able to do really well because there are certain things that work better when you're not trying to max, trying to minimize your drag regime. You know, right. insects are draggy. I mean, a bumblebee has a terrible lift to drag ratio compared to things that we build. I mean, it's just awful. I mean, if you gave it to him in specs for an aircraft, you'd be like, you fail. Like, go, <laughs> go back to engineering 101. I mean, the lift drag ratio is only, you know, like, can be, sometimes it's only like four or five to one for some of these insects. But it turns out they're using some of that drag to help them maneuver. Right. So, yeah, they don't fly very fast and they have to, and their metabolism is pretty high, but they can literally spin in place. In fact, a, a hoverfly. It takes about a three percent difference in, in the wing in, in the wing amplitude relative from one side to the other over the course of I think it's a, a like a tenth of a second or something in order to do a ninety degree turn. Oh wow! That that'll wow. turn ninety degrees. Now to give you an idea of how um, how big a dip, how, you know how precise that is, that is that's a smaller error if you will. That's a smaller. Uh, leeway than the error measurement on leveling our uh, wings on our highest end aircraft. <laughs> so if we were building wow. aircraft that were as sensitive as a as a hoverfly is to its flight, all of our F twenty twos would just fly off the runway and hit the water. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they they're you know they they may be really draggy, but they're working in this regime with these really precise motions and these really high oscillating speeds yeah. and all doing all these really cool and steady things. They got all this sticky air and they do all this cool stuff that allows them to, you know, spin around and flip over and tumble and things that we're just not used to doing. And of course the reason why we got stuck in one way of thinking for so long is because we got used to building one kind of thing. And then we're trying to build a different kind of flying thing and we're finding that all this variation, this is what you were saying, in that's out there amongst the um uh, uh there was out there amongst the 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 animal world, uh, in this yeah. particular case, but it could also be plants or fungi or anything else you're looking at, can be really helpful because there's a probably a reason that variance around, even though it may not look like it to us. Right. So I have one more question from Marco, Great. and this is about pterosaurs. Um, early pterosaurs had a long tail with a rhomboid mm -hmm. rudder at the end to aid them in flight. What later allowed pterosaurs to dispense with the tail? Oh, okay. Very, yeah, very good question. So there's some debate on this, in fact. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this a uh, quick two-part answer because I'm going to give what the conventional answer is and I'm going to give my answer because I actually differ, uh, I differ a little bit in my opinion on this from some of my colleagues. Okay. Um, and I'll explain why my opinion differs. So the, the, the classic thought is that they had this basically this rudder that helped stabilize or turn them, um, but it's draggy and so it's not as efficient as doing with the wings, kind of like the Microraptor problem, and that eventually what happens is that the, the neural systems get more sophisticated. There's selection for basically bigger brains, and some of the later chairs were using have slightly bigger brains, uh, particularly in areas that are related to sensory analysis, and they're able to eventually get, basically maneuver by just using what we call more dynamic rather than passive mechanisms. And so they can compensate better by just using their wings. They don't need the tail anymore. The tail thing gets reduced. Um, I think that's broadly probably true, except that we have some wind tunnel evidence. Uh, and I say we, I mean, not my group person, but just kind of in general, that there's guys in Chicago who have done this, have demonstrated that the tail probably didn't act as a very good rudder. Um, and so it probably wasn't really helping them turn. It was probably just, I suspect that the long tail was largely actually for balancing and climbing because I suspect some of those guys were, were, were spending time in trees when they weren't flying, to be honest. Uh, but it also in flight would make you more, pa still making you more passively stable just by being a vortex generator on the back of the darn thing, uh, which would add drag. So broadly, it's prob I still think it's probably true, uh, probably broadly correct, which is basically that you get a more sophisticated flight system later. Um, that, that can do these, that allows them to be more unstable but not crash. And that makes you more maneuverable. So if you can be unstable and you can handle it, that's good because you can be more maneuverable. And the early ones probably had to be more stable because they just couldn't handle unstable flight. 
Yeah. And so that that part of the argument is probably correct. The classic thing you see in a lot of reasons, and I don't, and uh, I, you know, whoever's asked the question is a very astute question, and I'll blame him or her at all for thinking, you know, for thinking of it as a rudder because you will still see that even in the literature published by professional paleontologists working on pterosaurs, it's still a common thought. Um, but the data don't actually back that up. It's being a rudder, but it probably did make them more passively stable. It'd be more like putting instead of being a rudder, it's more like putting the fringes on the back of an arrow, the fletching on an arrow, right? Or putting or putting you know on a on a dart or something like that. It's 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 more like that than, than a real rudder. Okay, that's awesome. Well, you know, we're wrapping up here at the end of the hour, so I, I did want to take some time and thank you, Michael. First of all, no problem. It was great having you um, as our first of many Science Sunday hangouts that we'll be doing here with. Uh, with uh, collaboration between Science Sunday, the page on Google Plus, and me nice. here at, at CosmoQuest. So I did want to thank you for taking your time to hop out here. I think there might be one or two more questions, if you wouldn't mind sticking around and may maybe making a comment in the event page, if there's anything else on there that we no weren't problem. able to get to today. That'd be fantastic. Is there anything you I'll want to add, Bedini, Michael? Um, no, thank you for coming. And yeah, this no was problem. awesome. Yes. Oh, thank you, Budini. Thank you, Scott, for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for for being flexible. I know that you know I, I got a little tied up there and, and had to get in a little late and ended up <laughs> broadcasting in from my apartment here, which is kind of funny. But uh, uh, fortunately, got to see a bone, so <laughs> yeah, exa exactly. You know, that's what everyone's always after. Uh, that's right. I'll just stop by your work sometime and, and just <laughs> there you go. You there you go. Time. Well, hey, you know, down down the road, maybe we'll do a more informal thing sometime uh, from the office or from the museum, and I can show you guys some stuff. So cool, right? Yeah. All right. Thanks well, so yeah. Thanks again. Um, it, for those of you uh, again watching tonight, um, this has been a, put on by Science Sunday and by CosmoQuest. I'm Scott Lewis from CosmoQuest and the Education and Public Outreach. There will be another broadcast in about two and a half hours. We have our virtual star parties where we hook up telescopes from um, astronomers from across the world, and we have commentary from um, professional astronomers as well. So we try to take a look at what the, the universe is bringing you. So we'll look forward to seeing you all there. Uh, thank you again. I'm Scott Lewis and Bedini, my wonderful, wonderful <laughs> co-host from Science Sunday. Yeah, thank you. And, um, all right. Yeah, take care. I'm going to end the broadcast. All right. <laughs> Bye, everyone.